to the History Bards podcast. This is your host, Michael Zucker, author of the Eisenhower Chronicles. We have a special guest for you today. Dr. Roni Rosenthal is a historical fiction writer and the author of Where the Lilacs Bloom Once Again. Thank you, Dr. Rosenthal, for being with us today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. To start off, since this interview is about you, can you tell us about your journey as a writer and why you decided to start writing historical fiction? Sure. So a little bit about me. Um, I was born in the beautiful city of Haifa in Israel. I, uh, I speak Hebrew, English, and a little bit of Spanish. I am a professor of language and literature at the University of Baltimore, at the University of Maryland, sorry, Baltimore County. And uh, I have been teaching for, I want to say forever, for at least for the past 15 years. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my journey as a writer and a little bit about the book, how it started. So uh, back in December 2009, uh, my father passed away. So I went home for the funeral. And after the funeral, I went to my father's home office. And on his desk, I found three things. I found a family album uh, of the family members from Romania. I found a family tree in my father's handwriting. So he wrote by himself the names. It was a partially a uh, family tree. And I found this little note that says, um, write their stories, tell the world what really happened to them. And so I did a couple of months before my father passed away, my parents came to visit me and I uh, will never forget this beautiful uh, Sunday, sunny morning, uh, my father and I went to a, a coffee house next to my house. It was Panera Bread. And we were just sitting there and talking, chatting about life and so on. And all of a sudden, I, you know, out of a gut feeling, I told my father, uh, Daddy, can you tell me the Friedis story again? And he said, sure. And I was working as a journalist reporter back then. So I pulled out from my bag a small uh, recording device and I just clicked on record and he he told me the story. So after the funeral, I came back here and I had the family photo album, I had the family tree and I had this small recording of my, with my father's voice telling me the story. So for the next couple of weeks, I just listened to the stories over and over and over again. I flipped through the family album. I tried to make some connections with the family tree and all of that. And I really asked myself, where do I begin? How do I even start telling their stories? Because that's what my father wanted me to do. So the next thing I did, since I'm in the academia, researcher and all of that, I went to the library and I sat there for days, for hours, just reading everything I could put my hands on related to Romania. I looked at the archives of old newspapers. I looked at the any books that I could find, articles, fiction, nonfiction, memoirs, everything I could find to read about Romania. Uh, in addition, I had the family tree, and then I had some postcards that um, my grandmother exchanged with her cousin, Fridi, which she is the character, main character of the book. And it was all in Romanian. So in handwriting, so for a while, and I do not speak Romanian. I really, I don't know almost any word in Romanian. So for a while, Google Translate has been my best friend. Uh, everything I could use Google Translate to help me with translating Romanian to English to Hebrew, I did. Um, oh, but Google Translate cannot translate handwriting notes. So I used my mom, who is still alive, still with us, and she speaks Romanian. So she helped me translate those old postcards. So at least I could, you know, get some idea of what's 
they were corresponding. Uh, letters, all the letters that we had in the house that I wanted to translate to understand what's going on. And then, so two things. I wanted to do a research, first of all, to understand the context, because my family lived in Romania since the beginning of 1900 until 1951, when my parents and grandparents moved to Israel, immigrated to Israel. So I wanted to understand at least the last 50 years from 1901 until 1951. So my research really focused on the major events in Romanian history. I wanted to know Romanian history, Romanian geography, understand the culture, understand the traditions. I'll give you an example. Fridi was known in the family to be the rebellious one. She went against everything that was accepted at the time. So I needed to understand what was acceptable in order to know what she was rebelling against. Um, so really, I did a lot of research. I think it took me about two or three years just to read and really understand what's going on. Uh, at the same time, I tried to complete the family tree because my father wrote what he knew, I guess, but he didn't have, he had some of the names, uh, at least the first names, not all of the last names. And some of the years that he thought probably they lived or died around those areas. And I tried to figure out really what, when, you know, like more information, more details. So I did the genealogy research uh, of my own family in Romania. The issue was that Romania has a very limited database. And I wasn't able to get a lot of the documents. I was able, with the help of amazing friends from Facebook groups, um, but they helped me find my grandmother's and her brother's birth certificates, for example. And then I started putting the puzzles, pieces, I call it one after the other to find out, okay, I have their birth date. So how old was their mother and where did they live and what happened to the father? A lot of questions, which some of them until today, I don't have an answer to. And some of them I was able to find. I was so happy that at least some of those documents are still survived. Another issue I had was the my family originated from uh, Piatra Nant, which is a city in the east, in, in the eastern north of Transylvania, Romania. And the archive, the main archive in the area, was burned down in 1950s. So most of the documents were, I guess, perished. So I had a lot of, you know, obstacles and, and times where I was almost giving up, but I, I just put through and after 12, almost 13 years of research and writing and research and deleting and editing and rewriting, finally the book was born. <laughs> so that's a little bit of the background story. Um, I'm happy to talk more, of course. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, 12 years on a single project. I mean, so there's one question that I have is why did you decide to write it as a novel and not as a nonfiction memoir of your family? So um, I wanted to really bring um, the characteristics of Freddie. So Freddie wrote a little bit and here's the thing, she, she loved writing and she wrote many poems. Only one survived, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't really want to write it as a nonfiction. I wanted people to be able... Okay, my goal or behind the book or behind the project is to really tell people what's going on, what happened in Romania. There is a lot of miscommunication. There is a lot of misknowledge about what really happened, the major events in Romania. And I wanted people to read and feel like they are connected or they feel more closely to the to the topic. Or they a lot of people read it and said they can relate. Like their families came from Romania or they heard stories about it and they can feel really what I was talking about when I was talking about Freddy, I was talking about David, her uncle, my great grandmother, Rosa, and so on. So I wanted to write it as in a way that will appeal to more people to read it and really gain the knowledge behind it about what happened in Romania. Um, for a nonfiction, I needed more, um, more database and I didn't want to go into the historical, I didn't want to focus only on the historical. I do have the historical perspective into the book, of course, but I, I tried to make it into a more engaging story that was uh, behind. Right, right. So kind of more flexible and more intimate than a nonfiction book allows. Exactly. Um, I think that's a large kind of 
draw toward historical fiction, both for writers and readers. Um, so we're talking about Eastern Europe in the first half of the 20th century. Um, I think almost anybody listening to this knows that that means that the two world wars and the Holocaust are large, or we are sort of the dominating events of that era in that region. Um, can you tell us how those events, you know, the impact that they have on this novel, the plot, things like that? Absolutely. So Freddie is a, Freddie, her uncle, David, who was my great, great uncle as well, and his family uh, were murdered in one of the pogroms in Romania in uh, 1941, in the Yashi pogrom. Um, one of the stories, or one of the, the actual documents, part of the letters that I was able to retrieve was a letter that David sent to his sister, my great grandmother Rosa, about a couple of minutes before they were uh, taken away, before they were taken to the death train from Yashi. So I, I intentionally I wanted to write his letter. I wanted I translated it from Iranian to English. I had to fill up some of the parts because some lines were already fading. Um, so that was one of the reasons I really wanted to share his story because I wanted to bring at least our, what we call our own personal Holocaust story um, mm. into the book. So I wanted people to read. Um, I'll, I'll share with you the comments I received sometimes after reading the book is I didn't know. People say I didn't know it happened in Romania. I didn't know the words. Uh, that the Jews were impacted by uh, World War II in Romania. We thought they were safe. Um, so it, it's, it was something that really guided me, but I wanted to bring the facts into the book, into the story. Into, and it's, it's really, this is really what happened. Uh, I always said that reality actually wrote the book. I wrote everything based on reality, on, on the real events of my family and the Jewish people in Romania. People didn't know, but Romania is uh, the second uh, state that killed the most Jews during World War II, uh, after Germany. Mm -hmm. And until 2004, uh, people didn't know it even happened in Romania because of communist regime and all of those, of course. Those stories were silenced, and they intentionally were silenced until the end of communism era, at least, you know, uh, even after 2004 and democratic elections is all of that. And I really wanted to write those stories to bring them out. It's not just my family, of course, I bring my own personal or their own personal stories into the book, but it happened to all of us. I really, really wanted to bring in this message. We need to know, we need it happened, you know, let's let's be aware of what happened. We all know that history, unfortunately, may repeat itself, right? So this sentence is always back in our minds. So I think people need to know about it. People need to be aware of what happened. Those are the facts. How do we learn from that? How do we move on, of course? But those are the facts. That's what really happened. Uh, that was very important for me to bring in. Right. I mean, that must have been you know, very difficult to both research and to portray. Um, I mean, the Holocaust just both as a subject, but also being that it's your family in particular. I mean, if it's even okay to ask, like, how were there any steps you had to take in terms of sort of emotionally processing that experience? So it's, uh, as I say, it never ever, it never ever ends. Mm -hmm. So it's still, I still read and I still research. And unfortunately, I don't have, a, I still have, documents that are missing and, and questions, open questions that I would never be able to receive answer to because my father passed away and all the generation in Romania already passed away. It's still a process. I mean, it's hard. It's really hard. I read over 120 other memoirs and books from Holocaust survivors. I attended many of the Holocaust survivors' uh, ceremonies and book talks and anything related. It's hard. It's, it's still very hard, and I think it's even harder when you realize that my own identity and my own faith could have been completely different if it didn't happen in Romania. If my family felt safe enough, I could have been born in Romania or have a completely different identity, you know. 
it's we call it my our own personal holocaust but it is it's many people feel that it's their own holocaust their families who have perished or murdered in the holocaust could have impacted them and the next generation for years to come um but i also talk about the freedy story and freedy i'll just give you like the juice of that uh, Freddy was a beautiful young woman. Uh, she was born in Bucharest in Romania. Uh, her mother was my great grandmother's uh, sister. So my grandmother his, and, and Freddy were cousins. And she was 18 years old. She fell in love completely head over heels with a scientist uh, named Freddy. She fell in love with him. She married him. She was happy for a couple of months. And then he disappeared all of a sudden and that was 1940s during the holocaust during the world war ii and all of that and of course she was jewish she came from a jewish heritage and family and all of that he disappeared and she was in prison she was in prison for 13 years she was sent to prison and then concentration camp or labor camp in romania uh, for a crime she didn't commit she didn't even know what she was she did wrong she she just fell in love and married a guy uh, apparently he was a spy and you know she was just a cover story uh, mm. but she went to prison because one of the reasons she was a Jew and it was easier to blame her uh, than to look for him um, and she was tortured she went through so many torture in prison and in, you know it's it I wrote it it was hard for me to write the torture that she went through, starvation and, and abuse, everything you can even think about. And, uh, but she was a strong woman. She was rebellious even as a teenager, uh, but she was strong. And she always, always, she never gave up hope. She believed in justice. And even in the concentration labor camp, she kept fighting for justice and she believed in the kindness of people. And she she never lost hope. She knew that something good is going to come up and she's going to win it. And even in the in the concentration camp, she met another person named Mircha and she fell in love with him and they married once they survived the, the camp. But she kept believing that everything will be fine. I personally met Freddy. She came to visit my parents when I was nine years old. And she spoke Romanian, of course, I didn't understand anything from the adults' conversation. But what I do remember about Freddy was a couple of things. Her big smile, you know, her eyes were shining. She laughed all the time. I also remember that she was kind of embarrassed with her own hands. Her nails were black, crooked, everything you can think of. And then she used to put like, nail polish, red nail polish from both sides of her nails, and then shove her hands quickly into white gloves. And I didn't understand why. And then she showed me one time that all her hands were full of scars. So even though she was laughing and smiling and having a great Romanian family dinner, the scars were still there. And she loved cats, right? She was never able to, to give birth after everything, after all the torture. So she loved cats and they adopted seven cats. <laughs> so she lived with them until I guess the day she, she passed away, but she was a happy person. That's what I remember about her. She was happy. She decided that she is going to live happily. She knows justice is going to win no matter what. That was the type of person she was. Right. I saw um, in a blurb of the book, I think on the Historical Fiction Club website, that it referred to her as a tragic hero um and I just kind of want to discuss about that description are you is that meant in that you know tragic in terms of what she endured or tragic in sort of like the literary sense like a Hamlet type I wouldn't say Hamlet I mean she um she was tragic but she was kind of a symbol for the era um, like she represents, so if you look at the story, you can say, okay, I understand what happened to the Jews at that era. She was kind of a symbol. She was never a leader. Like, I don't think she was the leader of the camp or anything like that. But inside, her, inside, she, she knew what she was doing. She was aware of her situation. She accepted what happened to her at some point, but she made an aware decision 
to live happily no matter what. For that, and that's that's very really important for me to tell people. And I, I do a lot of talks and lectures, and I and with young people, with teenagers and adults, that the message is that even in the darkest place, you can always find a light of sun. Like there is hope, something is going to be better. Even Freddie, who went through so much torture as a symbol or as a, a person that represents what happened to the Jews back then, could even survive, you know, have a better future once uh, once justice comes out or something like that. So right. I was just going to say, um, for listeners who are less familiar with either World War II or Romania's sort of role in the war, uh, could you just give some context to that? So um, you said that Romania was the second, other than Germany, was the country that, you know, was responsible most responsible for, um, you know, for com yeah. complicity in, in the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, so does that mean that Romania maintained its independence from Germany during the war and was allied with it? Was it ever taken over by Germany? Have we discussed that? Right. So Romania was never taken over by Germany. It was never, it was kind of independent. Um, the king, Carol II, was a the ruler from 1930 until 1940s. And then Romania started, so after World War I, Romania gains territories, Salvia, Doboja, Transylvania, and so on. Um, but during the World War, they had to surround and give away some of the geographical territories back to, um, to uh, Stalin and, and Germany and divide it to, back to Hungary, some of them. And King Carol uh, reputation began became uh, in a risk. So people in Romania, uh, citizens of Romania, were fed up from the economical situation and from uh, losing those territories, and they decided to rebel against the King Carol II. And um, and King Carol, to save himself, I guess, uh, appointed a marshal, Ion Antonescu. Uh, in 1940, and he gave him most of his power and said, okay, you are going to take over and you decide. And uh, until then it was a monarchy. I mean, most of his power back in 1937, he gained for himself, King Carol. And then 1940, he said, okay, Jan Antonesco, you are in charge. I, and he flew, he went to Portugal and they appointed as a symbol, a symbolic role, uh, King Carol II's son, who was King Mihai. And uh, Prince Mikhail, and then he became King Mikhail until 1947. Uh, but it was kind of a representative uh, role and not really uh, domestic or had any powers. And then Jan Antonescu, the next day, of course, he uh, made King Carol, a day after he gained power, he I, um, made King Carol abandoned and flee to Portugal. And um, um, and King Mikhail became the king, or Prince Mikhail became the king of Romania. Now, and Jan Antonescu was a big fan of uh, Adolf Hitler, and he collaborated mm -hmm. with the uh, German. Uh, king Carol also, the second, was also an ally with Germany, and Romania fought on the side of Germany and the allies, uh, not the allies, sorry, on the side of Germany at the beginning of World War II. But King Mihai was smart, I guess, and he believed in uh, that Romania uh, should not be involved in the war on the side of Germany. And in 1944, he arrested Ioan uh, Antonescu and gave him to Russia, and they charged him for criminal uh, uh, criminal crimes and all of the war crimes, criminal and all of those. And uh, Russia became and Romania became communist. So, uh, Romania switched side, and now she fought with the Allies. And uh, Russia walked into Bucharest, and uh, Romania became a communist um, country with the influence of Stalin. Of course, they collaborated now with Stalin, and so on. And that was until 1989, where after Ceausescu was the last uh, communist uh, ruler of Romania. And then, finally, 1990s. Uh, they had a uh, democracy elections back. So would you say that Romania sort of willingly joined the Eastern Bloc after World War II? Yes, definitely. They collaborated with them, of course, and definitely they wanted to be part of uh, 
of the Eastern, of the more modernized world uh, to overcome their own economical crisis and so on. Okay. So how did this Romania view, I know we're getting a little off topic from your novel, I want to return to that in a second, but I guess, so it viewed the Soviet Union as a more reliable partner than, let's say, you know, the United States and NATO. Yes, so Romania, uh, so King Mikhail actually wanted to collaborate with the US and um, and Britain, but as far as I understood, uh, US didn't want to get any more power off another country. They wanted Romania to stay independent and uh, they didn't reject officially, but they didn't respond to the pleas from King Mikhail. And the only one who wanted to walk into Bucharest or take over uh, Romania or collaborate because they wanted them to keep their independent status was Russia or Stalin mm. at the time. Okay, so I guess we're turning more directly to your novel. Can you tell our listeners sort of the writing style that you use, the sort of proportions between prose and dialogue? I believe I read in a review that it uses a bit of a nonlinear timeline that it goes back and forth between two eras. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, absolutely. So I wrote it, the book from two perspectives. One is Frida's story, uh, which began when she was 18 at the time. And then another perspective from my great grandmother, Rosa, uh, who was born in 1986 and about her family. Um, so it's kind of back and forth or it's kind of parallel stories between those two. Um, what was really important for me when I wrote the book was to stay with the facts, to stay with the truth of what really happened. I'll give you an example. Uh, I had an argument with my editor and she said, you know, why did you decide to kill uh, that and that character? Why didn't you give them a chance for a closure just to talk a little bit about that? And I said, it wasn't my decision. Someone made a decision that she's going to pass away before they have a chance to for a closure. So I really tried to stay with, with what really happened. That was really important for me. That was one of the lines that guided me through the book to write what happened. I, I said reality wrote the book for me. And it did. I, I just followed. I wrote, but I wrote, I followed the truth. I followed the facts. So it's just the fact that I knew of. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was looking through the documents or when I did the research and, and looked for the document that I was able to find, an organization in Romania that is called a, an organization that um, investigates communist crimes. They sent me, they, they found, uh, they did some research and they sent me some documents about Friedi and Mircea and all of those. And in the document, they have the wrong years. Now, I don't think it's intentional and it's it's a little bit confusing because I have postcard. So they said that Friday was released in 1956. I already have postcards from 1953 when she was released and she corresponded with my grandmother. So Friday was arrested in 1940s and someone said it can't be that she was, you know, she stayed for 1940s until 1953 for 13 years, probably because of the change in the rules and, and and different leaders and all of that, she should have been, you know, she should have been released or get an amnesty, but she wasn't. And according to the family stories. And when I found those documents, I said, the dates are wrong. And that's one of the questions that I wish I had someone to ask, but I don't. I know that she corresponded in 1953 because she said that she was free. So how come the document, the official one, said that she was still in, in labor camp until 1960? I don't have anyone to ask. I mean, some questions are just, you know, stayed open. So I wish I had someone to ask. And, and I want to give an advice, if possible, to our listeners. If you do have, if you do conduct a family search, try to do it as soon as possible when you have family, people still living. Don't postpone it. I postponed it for years. Now, after my father passed away, I have more questions than answers. But if you can, you know, even if you're in your 20s, go to your family, record them, have the stories on tape, have them ready. Even if you're not ready to write it now, even if you never want to write them, just listen to your parents and grandparents 
have those stories with you. You never know how it's going to affect your own life. So better on. I'm sure many listeners who are either parents or grandparents are applauding, <laughs> being told uh, to listen to parents and grandparents. Um, this as we start to wrap up our interview here, do you have any other advice for, let's say, younger writers who think that historical fiction might be the genre that they want to dedicate their literary career to? I would say go for it. I would. The first thing I would advise them is find your own words, find your own voice. Don't try to copy, imitate other writers. We all, we are all unique. You know, we we can't judge ourselves by someone else. Nah. So find your own word, find your own voice. You have it. It's unique. It's yours. And then write down. Just don't hesitate. Just write down. You're going to edit and read it and re-edit it and delete it and write again so many times. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about what you're writing right now. Just let the story fly. Find your words for that. You can always go back, change it first person, third person. Doesn't matter right now. The details just let the story live. And then it will, sometimes it will guide you by itself. It will take you. Right. Are there any other sort of upcoming events or anything else about your novel that you want to tell our listeners before we close? So a couple of really exciting news about the book. First of all, I want to say thank you for awarding me the book awards. The book, book won nine book awards so far, which I'm very uh, honored to receive. Thank you. Um, I would say, so the next project in the book is being translated right now to Hebrew and should be published mm -hmm. soon in Hebrew. And then an exciting news just I heard recently is the book is going to be uh, translated to Romanian. So I think for Fridi and the family, it's a great closure because Fridi had to flee Romania, but her story is coming back, which I think it's so exciting for her. I mean, I hope she can hear me, but it's really exciting. And then, of course, I, I keep talking and I keep giving lecture just because I want people to hear about the story about what really happened in Romania. So I'll, I have book talks and I have book festivals coming up and, and you know, and, and I'm always happy to hear from listeners and from readers. I get so many beautiful comments. Please email me or text me or find me on Facebook. I want to hear your voice. It's so important. It's really important. Thank you. And for our listeners, once again, the title of the novel is Where the Lilacs Bloom Once Again. I want to thank Dr. Rosenthal for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. We'll see you next week with another historical fiction author. Keep on reading. Thank you. Thank you for having me.